Hello and good morning. Welcome to Tower Hill. We're so glad you're here this morning. We're hoping the sun comes back out. Uh, and hello to all of you that are joining us online. We're so glad you're able to worship with us. Uh, my name is Jen Junta. I have the privilege of working with our middle school programming here at Tower Hill. And we'd love to know more about you if you're a guest with us this morning. Um, please uh, give us a scan on the QR code in front of you or on the screen above so we can learn more about you. And you can also stop by our guest services in the lobby or find anyone with a bright green lanyard on. We're so excited for what God has been doing here at Tower Hill in people's lives. And it could not be done without your generosity. Uh, you can give um, by scanning the QR code in your pew or on the screen above. And you can also make a check or cash donation in the drop, giving drop boxes out in the lobby located on either side of the balcony stairs. And we want to thank you in advance for your continued support in our ministries here. Uh, this week is your last chance to sign up for Spring Small Group. Um, dive a little deeper into your faith and find your people in a small group. It's a great way to get connected here. Uh, there's so many awesome groups to choose from. We actually have, which I'm interested, a pizza eating group. So that would be awesome. Uh, we have yoga groups to couple studies, working mom groups, young adult groups, and so many more. So check out the small groups and pick one that would work for you. And finally, if you're considering joining Tower Hill, we have new member classes coming up later in April. That's right, they're having two now. Um, Christianity 101 and joining Tower Hill. So to learn more about that, use the QR code above on our website as well, and reservations are required. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our loving God. We have gathered to worship God in spirit and in truth, to observe, as the scripture says, to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So let's welcome the presence of our risen Lord among us with the responsive call to worship found in your bulletin. Please stand, embody or in spirit, and we'll invite the Lord to bring his love to us. Are any among you suffering? Then let us pray. Are any of you cheerful? Then let us sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? Then let us turn to each other for God's healing touch. The prayer of faith will save us and God will lift us up.
Love's redeeming work is done. Our Lord has fought the fight and the battle is won. And he invites us to agree with him that we are in need of a redeemer. Would you please join me in the prayer of confession? Forgiving God, like Jonah, we resist when asked to tell the story. We find it hard to confess the name of Jesus. We are awkward and feel inadequate. But you have called us to speak and to act. Like Simon and Andrew, James and John, help us to rise up and follow wherever you lead. Lord of surprising light, make us followers. My friends, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, he forgives us all of our sins. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now let us continue to give glory to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit by declaring our faith as believers have across the centuries with words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My friends, on the night that Jesus was raised from the dead, he stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Let's share the peace of the Lord with one another.
That was beautiful. Thank you. Good morning. How is everybody doing? Pastor Jason is away. I'm Pastor Chris. Uh, it's the week after Easter. It's a beautiful day. We just had an earthquake. An eclipse is coming. And ironically, I just wrote a sermon about fear. So here we go. Um, it was written before an earthquake happened, I promise. Uh, but it makes a great intro to a sermon. Do you have fear? Has it ever crept into your life? Um, has it affected your life? Anxiety, maybe? Where have you seen fear in your life? I want you to sit for that for a moment. Sit with it. Today, we are going to be focusing on fear. When I was younger, it was, I am the third child. I am the youngest. I am the baby. It was assumed that I was going to like roller coasters and scary rides like my siblings. I did not at all. Uh, I remember uh, my dad taking me on a ride and me screaming so hard that they had to stop the ride. Um, I was terrified of any kind of rides that moved just even a little bit too fast. I even remember we went to uh, Williamsburg and Bush Gardens, okay? And, uh, you know, Williamsburg has all the historical sites and Bush Gardens has all the roller coasters. That week I was so interested in the historical stuff. I mean, I couldn't get enough of 16th century wigs and how they were made. Uh, just fantastic. I remember my, my family saying, wow, Chris is really into this stuff. So intellectual. I, we really like him, really loving this historical stuff, but I just wanted to avoid roller coasters at any time at all. When I was a freshman in high school, I made the mistake of telling my brother that maybe I'd be interested in a roller coaster. Maybe I'd try it out. I don't know. Maybe the next day he was driving me to Great Adventure. The next day. And then as we're walking in, we went with a group of friends. I was like, okay, so here's the deal. I want to go to the kiddie park first. You know, try out one of those little kiddie roller coasters. Maybe move up from there and like something, something just a little bit higher than that. Maybe if we have time, bigger roller coaster. But I don't think we'll have enough time. Um, and he wasn't even making eye contact with me as we walked into the park. Uh, he did not care what my agenda was. Um, and he walked me straight on to the biggest ride in the park, first one. And of course, uh, of titles is not something that brought me any kind of peace or calmness. It was called the Great American Scream Machine, if you ever remember that. That is not a title that brings any peace to anything. And I remember sitting on the line and being like, feeling like I was on death row being like, if you would like to go in front of me, go ahead, you can go in front of me, no problem, you go in front of me too. Um, and then you get on the roller coaster and it's like a click, 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 click. I mean, it's the worst feeling in the world and they leave them a kind of loose, the things, uh, just being absolutely terrified. But I did it. I faced the fear. The rush was great. But why did I do it, right? Why did I push myself to do that? I was an extreme extrovert. I did not like being away from people. I wanted to be with people, right? So I needed to conquer this fear because I wanted to be with people. They call this kind of stress a healthy stress. When you push yourself to do something that's good for you, right? One where you're accomplishing something, where you're breaking a fear, that's called a healthy stress. But did you ever get so scared of something that you rearrange your life to avoid it? I'm sure you got some examples in there where you're rearranging your life to avoid something 
because you were so scared of it. Today, as we go into our message, we're going to be focusing heavily on the Israelites and how they rearranged a lot of things in their life because of fear. Now, I need to start by giving you a little history on the Israelites. Some of you will know this history. Some of you may find it interesting. Some of you may not have known anything about this, and that's okay. You might remember that the Israelites were first slaves in Egypt, right? And God comes to Moses and says, you are going to be the man that gets them out of Egypt. I do not want them slaves in Egypt. I got bigger plans for them. So Moses uh, leads them to, to the, the Red Sea, and, and God parts the waters of the Red Sea. They, they walk through the Red Sea, and they get to the desert. Um, and you might even remember that they get to the desert and they're like, man, it was just so much better in slavery. We had food back there. Um, already scared of the journey that they just took and what they're going to have to do in the desert. But they're in the desert and God is like, listen, I'm going to give you a land of milk and honey. I'm going to give you an awesome, awesome land, the promised land. It is yours. But all you have to do is trust. You just have to trust me, and I will get you into that land. It'll be yours. That's it. And so they go to the land, and they send some spies out, and they check out the land, and they come back, and they're like, there's giants there. We cannot take over those people. We can't do it. There's no way we could possibly go into that promised land that God says. There are people that are big that will destroy us. And God's like, all you had to do was trust me. All you had to do was trust me. And so what God did was he said, you know what? I'm waiting for the next generation. Maybe the next generation will trust me. So God made them stay in the desert for 40 years. Now, you may have heard, right, that the, that the Israelites had to stay in the desert for 40 years. But you may have never known why. That is why. They were too scared to go into the promised land. They did not trust God to get them into the promised land. So God said, you know what? I'm waiting for the next generation. They were not the greatest generation. They were the scared generation. So where we come to the story this week is the new generation, the next generation, are not those people. They are not the people that are scared to go into the promised land. They are the sons and the daughters of those people. They have seen the misery of their parents for not trusting God. They have seen the consequences of those people and they're like, we're not going to be like them. We're going to push in. We're going to do it. And they are learning to be fearless. And they're led by a guy named Joshua. And Joshua is the successor to Moses. In fact, Moses saw the promised land, but he saw it from a distance before he died. Moses never got to the promised land. It was Joshua that was taking up the reins and running through with it and leading the next generation into the promised land. But all through his leadership, we keep hearing God say certain words to Joshua that will bring so needed to us. Here it is. This comes from Joshua chapter 1, 6 through 7. Be strong and courageous. This is God telling Joshua, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. So why does God keep telling Joshua, be strong and courageous? Be strong and courageous. Because Joshua is terrified. He's a human, right? But Joshua is getting the strength to stand up to those fears. 
And, and have you ever had a time in your life where you had to face a fear and there was no backing down? You had to do something and you just had to push through. You had to take a deep breath and say, let's do it. There's no looking back. This is Joshua. He knew that this day was coming and he is going to get the Israelites into the promised land. You know, this, as, as I was reading this over and over again, I was getting this feeling. Remember that guy, Todd Beamer, right, on 9-11? Uh, he was in the, the plane, and, uh, and, you know, and he was the one that led the people to, they knew that this plane was going to go and do some not good stuff and hurt a lot of people. And Todd Beamer stood up, got the people organized to, to go and fight the terrorists in, in this plane. And right before he got off the phone, he says, let's roll. Remember that? Let's roll. This is Joshua telling the Israelites, let's roll. Let's roll. Was, was he scared? Yeah, probably. But over and over and over again, God is saying, be strong, be courageous. So Joshua gathers all the Israelites, the children of the desert dwellers. So Joshua gets up and stands before the Israelites, and this is what happens. This is Joshua 3, 1 through 16. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way, but keep a distance about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark and do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves. Think of those words. So Joshua is there with the people, and they're on this side of the Jordan River. Pretend that this is the Jordan, right? He's on this side, and he's saying, consecrate yourselves. Now, you may not have heard that word before. Maybe if you're a Catholic, former Catholic, uh, maybe you've heard the word consecrate, but you may not know what it means. It means to set yourself apart for the holy. To consecrate means to set apart for the holy. Basically saying that there's a part of you that needs to separate and stay here. And then there's a part of you that needs to be set apart for the holy. On this side of the journey of the Jordan River, there's a part of you that you need to leave here, and then the part of you that you need to consecrate and set for the holy that is about to happen. The side here you need to leave behind. You see, you will not see the miracle if you don't set that part aside and set this part aside for the holy. You'll miss the miracle all over it. Set yourself apart. Uh, there's, there's a part in you that will only go so far with your faith. I can trust God with this, like maybe Sunday mornings. I can trust God with Sunday mornings. I'll give him Sunday mornings, right? But work... Mm, I can't trust him with that. I need to be in control of that one. Or uh, my, maybe, maybe my finances. I, I like to be in control of that one. Or this one. I like to be. God can have this one and this part of me, but he can't have this part of me. We may not actually say those words, but they're in there. There's a part of you that we need to set apart for the holy. We need to consecrate it. One of the biggest reasons we don't let our faith bleed into the other parts of our lives and areas 
is because of control. And why do we like control? Why is control even there? Because of one word, fear. That's why we like to be in control. Because we feel like we're controlling our fear if we are in control. And what Joshua is telling the people is set that apart. Set that apart and let God take over. Let the holy take over and consecrate it. One of the most repeated phrases in all of the Bible is fear not. Every time an angel shows up, every time God shows up, you always hear the words fear not. Because literally, as soon as people see the holy, they get so scared. So they have to say, fear not. Calm down. Fear not. It is words that we need to constantly hear all the time. Here's the thing. We can't experience the holy if we don't set certain things aside and leave them on the one side of the Jordan River. We're clinging on to fear. We can get a little bit of the holy, we can get a little bit of the miracle, but we can't get all of it unless we consecrate ourselves for the holy. Consecrate yourselves. Set it apart for the holy. Then this is said. So, this is uh, verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. The water stopped. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. So they crossed over the Jordan. So he brings them to this, this river. And we've seen this before, the Red Sea, right? Their people have done this before. <clears throat> but this is different. Because you remember a, a Moses brought them to the river. He puts his arms up and the, and the water stopped. They had dry land and they just crossed it. But this was different because in this story the waters we heard they said that they were at flood levels they made sure to tell you that these waters were flowing it wasn't just a trickle brook that they were going through it was flood levels here but the difference between the Red Sea and the Jordan River here is that they had to put their feet in the water first. So God's saying, I need to see that you trust me. I need to see some more. You consecrated yourself. You set yourself apart. You're leaving things behind. Show me that you trust me. Put your feet in the waters first. And they did. They put their feet in the waters. And as soon as they put their feet in the waters, the waters stopped. These men and women had to sacrifice their lives in order to see something amazing happen with God. But they had to do that first. I remember when I just graduated high school, um, my youth leaders asked me if I wanted to go do a, a ministry in New York City. It was called Bridges. Um, and in Bridges, you go and you hand out clothes underneath all the different bridges in New York City. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge was one. I know we went to Battery Park for one. Um, and it was all to New York City homeless men. Uh, the, the shelters all did a lot for the women and the children but at that time, they didn't do a ton for the men that were, that were there was a lot more men that were homeless in New York City. Um, and so this is how they sold it to me when I was 18 years old. They said, we're going to go to Little Italy afterwards, and we're going to get a really nice dinner, and it's on us. And I was like, I'm in. 
I've never been to Little Italy before, and the free dinner sounds incredible. Um, and also they said, uh, you, know, you know, we're going to be going out, and we're going to be handing out clothes to, to the homeless people. And I was like, ooh, I'll feel good about myself. That's great. Uh, the other thing is I had literally no friends at the time. Uh, all my friends went off to college, and I was staying home going to community college. I literally had nothing to do on Friday nights. So they also took a, a, an empty Friday night off of my calendar. So it was great. All the things were looking upward on this trip. So I remember as we are, we are driving, and I'm just loving the view of New York City. Usually I went to New York City. I was going to a baseball game or something fun. You know, uh, but here I am driving in with them, and they start telling me what we're going to be doing that night. And I remember uh, the conversation very well. Uh, my youth leader is like, here's the deal. When we get there, the van that you are going to be working with, because we all had different minivans, um, each with a different item of clothing or food or things like that, he said, the van that you're working in is the one that everybody's going to go to first. It's the one that has pants. Everybody wants pants, and they come to yours first. So it's going to be really popular, and people are going to be backed up and lined up. And he says, what your job is, is that you're going to be at the back of the van, and you're going to get everybody's pants size and then yell it back to us on the inside of the van, and we'll give it to you. But here's the thing. There's a lot of people, and sometimes it can get a little restless. And, and people start yelling. Sometimes they start shoving. He's like, you're going to have to use your personality. You're going to have to try to calm them down. They're going to be pushing you back into the van you just have to sometimes stay strong and push back a little bit and keep them calm. And I'm sitting, driving to New York City, hearing about this. And so I'm like, okay, all right. So where are you going to be? And he's like, I'm going to be on the inside of the van. And where am I going to be? You're going to be on the outside of the van. Right, I'll be on the outside of the van, and you're on the inside of the van. Right, the dinner did not sound all that great at that point. Uh, my nerves got the best of me. I literally almost threw up before we started because, I mean, everything I was always told in New York City is you put your head down and you walk right? I was not having to come face to face with, with people uh, and, and really kind of get into, uh, into conflict and stuff like that. I, this is way out. I mean, I was a kid that didn't even like to raise my hand in class, let alone be thrown into this, this world. And, uh, but I had no choice at this, at this point. And um, man, I wanted to run. I wanted to run, but I did it, and I get there, and uh, I remember having so much compassion for these men. I mean, the humility that they had to line up like this. I, I couldn't have endured just even a fraction of what they endured in their life. You know, I've heard... Uh, I know a lot about Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Rogers used to carry a note in his pocket, and, and the note said, if you know someone's story, you can love anyone. And I know that these men, they had stories. They had stories. And, and yeah, there was a smell of alcohol and different things, but they were great. They were funny. So I'm giving out clothes, and and, and, and I remember one of them just giving me this massive hug and saying, you have no idea what this will do for me. I have an interview on Monday. This is going to change my life. You know, we talk about miracles, right? Was I doing any kind of miracle? No. 
I came there for dinner. I, it was God doing the miracle. It wasn't me doing the miracle. I was just handing out a pair of pants. I didn't do anything. You know where the miracle was truly happening in all of this? Because the pants, they probably had them for a couple of days or a week or whatever. Like, it wasn't a miracle. The miracle was happening in my heart there in New York City. God was transforming my heart in the streets of New York City. But here's the thing. In order for the miracle to happen, in order to see that, I had to put my feet in the water. I had to go from this side of the Jordan and put my feet in the water to get to the other side. Transformation happened in the water. Just like Joshua and the men with their feet in the Jordan River, I had to get my feet wet. The miracle didn't happen, so my feet got wet. Hey, I, I was, if I was told what I was going to be doing before I even got into the van, I would not have gone into the van. Just like Joshua told all the men what they would be doing right there on the shore. He didn't tell them before. I wouldn't even entered into the van. But God brought me to the edge of the river, and then all I had to do was jump in and get my feet wet. God didn't tell Joshua and the people of Israel about putting the feet in the water. He just said, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Follow me, and I will get you to the other side. And that's when the miracle will happen. The miracle part was never done by me. It was never anything awesome that I did. In fact, I was the scaredy cat. In consecrating themselves, they set themselves apart for the Israelites of old and said, we're not going to be like our, our fathers and mothers. We are crossing that river and we're going to the promised land. You know, we have doing, been doing church for too long where we just go to this place and we, we find friends and hopefully we get a, a great sermon or and it'll entertain us and, and maybe we'll feel good for, for, for the day. And, but here's the real thing. Church is church when it brings broken people and messed up people to be transformed and through that river. That's when churches are churches. People that are just like me, messed up and broken, that get transformation in their lives. To shed the junk, leave it on the other side of the river, and then move across. But here's the thing. We can't do that until we get our feet wet. Until we put ourselves out there and we face our fears. And we can't help people be transformed if we're not even transformed ourselves. Joshua and the Israelites that day said, that's it. I'm done being a desert dweller. Forty years my family has been here. We're moving to the other side. You know, last week was Easter. You know, one of the most fascinating things about Easter that I can't get over, and every time I'm always sold out, on this story, and, 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 I, and I know it's real because of this happens, because on, on Thursday and, and Good Friday, we look at the, the disciples, right? They were scared out of their minds. They locked doors. They ran. They denied Jesus. They even went fishing. They even were like, I'm going back to what I used to do. I'm going fishing, right? They all did that. And less than three days later, their whole lives were transformed, and they literally went and said, I'm going to tell people about this. I'm going to transform my life. I am going to die just like Jesus died. Like, I'm going to be... How do you go from totally scared, running away, locking doors, going fishing, and then three days later, totally transformed, willing to die for it? Changes like that don't happen that quickly. I'm sorry. I've been around people a lot, and I've been doing church a lot. People don't change that quickly. Something had 
to happen, right? It had to happen. A miracle happened. Resurrection happened. A transformation of a dead man into a living one. They witnessed a death. They saw God in the flesh rise from the dead. Maybe you're like me. You know what? That every Sunday you have an awesome worship, feel good, but each week you get back into the same track of the same things that you keep wanting to shed, right? It's like our feet are still on this shoreline. But we just have to get our feet wet. Maybe you and I can finally put our feet in the water. Set ourselves apart for the holy. Because that's when we'll see true transformation happen. That's where we'll see lives changed. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you transform lives, that you are working in us in all that you do. We thank you for all that you're doing. Amen. As we come to this communion table, I love to always point out that this is a table. Often, often I hear uh, that this is an altar, and it's not. It's a table. Years ago, my uh, son and I, we made a table out of wood. I am not the best carpenter. It is not the prettiest table, but we use it. It is our dining room table. And the thing that is beautiful about it is that it's our table. It's where we eat together. It's where we have our fun conversations. It's where we even have fights often. It's where the messy happens. But it's the thing that brings us together as a family. This table brings us together with God. And it brings us together. And Jesus sits at this table with us. And this meal is the sustenance that keeps us going on this journey together. Let us say our words together. They are in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with humble hearts, filled with thankfulness for your infinite love. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his body and blood for our redemption. We are grateful for the sacrifice made for us on the cross and for the grace of your forgiveness. Lord, help us to never take for granted the precious gift of salvation you have bestowed upon us. May we always remember the price paid for our freedom, and may the memory of your love inspire us to show mercy and kindness to all we meet. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of coming to your table, partaking in the, the body and the blood of your Son. May we always take to heart the importance of this sacrament and live our lives in a way that reflects your goodness mercy. Lord God, there, there's so much that we have on our minds and our hearts, whether it is silent prayers that we come to you with today, the worries of loss, the worries of life, the pain of loss or broken relationships. God, you know our prayers even before we're able to visualize them in our own head. God, this morning we pray for people all over that are experiencing pain, whether it is the people on our prayer list, the people around us, the people in our country and other countries that are near, not nearly as blessed as we are. There are people that are struggling through war. Lord,
Lord, there's so much war going on all around the world, and we pray for peace in all of that. And with all this tragedy, we ask you a peace that's beyond all understanding. We know that only you can provide that kind of peace. Lord God, we ask you to be with this congregation. Help us to love each other the way you call us to love each other. Help us to show each other the kind of love for you that you desire us to live with. Lord, we thank you. We end this time saying the words that your son taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And every time you eat from this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again.
Let us stand and sing our last hymn, which is 236, The Strife is Over. we go out, we now know that to cross from this side to this side, all we have to do is get our feet wet. But God does all the miracles. He does all the work. We just have to trust him. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.